Hi, After Buzzers. Today I'm in studio with Dominic Bogart. You can see him coming up in the Glass Castle. You may have seen him in Birth of a Nation. All that and more coming up. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. I love the clapping. And seriously, it's my favorite way to start any interview. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I know. You just yeah. can't feel bad when you come in to a big audience full of clapping. Favorite. So, <laughs> favorite it, it, too? It feels like you're being, like, showered a little bit like you're at the beach and it's it's you're not being pulverized by waves you're just you're just enjoying the water showered by clapping yeah. I like it I feel cleaner already hey after buzzers I am Zoe Hewitt you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at real Zoe Hewitt and sitting directly to my left in studio with me today is Dominic where can everyone find you I'm on uh, I'm just new to it but I'm on Twitter Dominic Bogart same with Instagram and uh, yeah, I just kind of update that and Facebook here and there. <laughs> <laughs> You're new to it, but you are not new to acting. You've been doing this for a while, but you've got the big movie, The Glass Castle, coming out in August, which is fantastic. I mean, so many people looking forward to this film. It's such a popular book. When you were first cast, now you knew the director from working with him before, and you had to sort of prove yourself a little bit, didn't you, to the, to the execs? Yeah, a little bit. Um, what what happened was um, he's a good friend of mine, Dustin Daniel Cretton, was uh, uh, set to do this Lionsgate film, uh, this brilliant uh, memoir by Jeanette Walls, uh, The Glass Castle, and they uh, needed to uh, get the cast together, and um, I helped uh, put Brie on tape. So they put Brie. This was just before she won an Oscar. So she doesn't need to put herself on tape anymore, I don't <laughs> think. Uh, but uh, it was cool, so I got to hang with her and Gil and Netta, the, the, the uh, producer. And Dustin and I, we'd been sh we've been shooting films together since uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. um, short films and uh, his first feature, I Am Not a Hipster. Um, anyway, the, as far as that's concerned, he's like, I'm going to try to slip you in there with these guys. And he helped mm -hmm. with Lionsgate, you know, for this this nice supporting role. Um, and Bree's down with it. Mm -hmm. She likes your work. Um, so we just, he, he helped edit a reel of some previous footage that I had from f uh, previous films. And, yeah, so that we just kind of slipped it in there. And I, I don't know, maybe they just <laughs> were, fell asleep at the wheel. But they, they let little old me be a part of this <laughs> film. I'm... Um, over the moon. It was uh, an amazing experience. Well, no, no one fell asleep at the wheel. You had the credits to back it up and the work to back it up. And I feel like it's actually a really nice story because you had worked with the director and it wasn't just like, thanks for helping me. See you later. You know, that he really wanted to help you in return. Yeah. That's a nice relationship. Oh, yeah. He's scratching my back. <laughs> I'm scratching his. Um, but I, I am lucky to be a part of that storytelling mm -hmm. family. Um, uh, very loyal family. The mm -hmm. the composers, Joel P. West. He's been working on all of Destin's films um, over the past decade and a half. Um, so everybody's you know like went from roommates to mm -hmm. workmates to roommates again to <laughs> workmates again. Um, and uh, Brett Pollock also mm -hmm. I've worked with him as well in previous uh, projects and mm -hmm. and so. It, Kind of, and because Bree and Destin had their own uh, shorthand, and and we were all speaking in the same vernacular, mm -hmm. and that was that made it uh, really easy once we got on set, and um, you know we were able to just kind of swim around the story and the script, you know, and he was he was up for uh, switching it on the fly, and mm -hmm. you know just feeling it out as we as we did. I was able to have some really great scenes in um, the Glass Castle with. Uh, Bree and Woody Harrelson, and it was, I was afraid. I'll, I'll be honest, I was, I was nervous, uh -huh. and it, and it's kind of some 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 heavy uh, material. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was an interesting few days with them, and um, I think it works. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen the film yet, but I, I've seen a little bit of it from uh, doing mm -hmm. you know, additional dialogue on it. So um, I'm. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, be a part of a film that's going to move people, mm -hmm. and that's sort of 
Destin's trademark is he tugs on the heartstrings. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And so for anyone who's not familiar with the plot of the film, can you give a quick synopsis? Yeah, the, the film is um, it's about uh, Jeanette Walls. It's her memoir. It was um, about her, her and her siblings growing up um, with these nonconformist parents who were both artistic and imaginative and um, very smart and intelligent, but they didn't want to live on the grid. Mm -hmm. And so they grew their kids up very nomadic, um, but also in a, uh, um, a poverty stricken mm -hmm. state, which made it very difficult for the, for the family to be functional, for the kids to, to grow up healthy. Um, however, the story is about this um, young woman coming of age through her through her years, and basically um, sort of finding you know resilience as a child growing up under those circumstances, and then and and loving loving that, still loving her parents and her father especially, um, but then finding a way to um, forgive him mm -hmm. later on in her life. And so it's a it's a beautiful story about fathers and daughters and mm -hmm. and uh, fathers and sons and it's just a family piece but it's mm -hmm. it goes through uh, it spans uh, about three decades and it's a uh, it's a it's beautifully shot and um, you know it starts in like the 60s and through the 70s and 80s and it's a uh, it's going to be a fun sort of American experience, yeah. I think, uh, to watch them travel across the uh, mm -hmm. across the plains and into the south. And uh, I, I, I'm in their particular town of Welch, West Virginia. Uh, my character uh, appears, and so uh, there's a lot of mining um, going on in it, and uh, and then a lot of uh, sort of cityscape for New York City. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like that you called her family nonconformist because I would have said dysfunctional. So I feel like you really put a very positive spin on her family mm -hmm. upbringing. Now, your character in the book, correct me if I'm wrong, he's someone that she meets at a bar. And so is that the case? Do we see a similar storyline for your character in the movie? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I meet uh, her at the bar. I think at first what we see is, a, you know, this is a, this is a young uh, girl uh, coming into her womanhood and um, she's finally sort of being taken seriously or put into a situation where that is possibly romantic um, and a lot of people a lot, a lot her and her siblings throughout the story are trying to find um, an escape mm -hmm. in a way from their poverty from their embarrassing um, shame that they hold with them uh, growing up and uh, and my my character in a way has a similar feeling he doesn't want to be stuck in a small town working a job that'll be the death of him and uh, and so we connect in a way mm -hmm. uh, there um, but that's not all it doesn't and I, and I don't want to give it away but it's a uh, it's it's nice and short and sweet and not so sweet but it's all right it's um it's an interesting uh, almost life uh, uh maybe a cathartic mm -hmm. moment in the in the uh, story of this woman's life and do you think that having just won the Oscar for Brie Larson, would, was that what was so intimidating? You said you're intimidated a little, like coming onto set. Was it because of that, or was it something else? No, it's because she's well, like really wise beyond her years, um, and also it was a kind of an uncomfortable uh, situational thing, character-wise and story-wise. So I had to sort of balance, you know how we can make that feel legitimate on camera and on set while at the same time you know keeping a nice distance and a and also a nice friendly rapport so it's uh it's strange it's different every time i go out i, I don't i don't really know um that i use the same sort of method of like how i interact with my coworkers because it, it changes from person to person mm -hmm. and from set to set is a different 
uh, feeling. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as Bree is concerned, I just, um, I, I, I can't say enough good things about her as an artist and mm -hmm. as, as a person. She's really put together, mm -hmm. like in her, with her activism, with her sort of. She's just, she's just so well adjusted, way more well adjusted than I am, and I'm, <laughs> I'm quite a bit older than her, so. <laughs> I, I was, I was, I'm just, I've always been really impressed with her work because mm -hmm. it's so like close to the hip and just real and she's not just a pretty girl, you know, mm -hmm. it's just very, and though she is beautiful, it's just very, um, I think she's pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. She's, she's bringing the game up higher. She's raising the bar. Mm -hmm. And not being just a pretty girl, that's like saying, well, you're not just a football player because you played football all through high school, but that's not what defines you, right? We've got so much more to you in these roles, and a lot of the roles that you've done, coincidentally, <laughs> no reflection on you personally, but a lot of these roles, you're playing a lot of like darker characters. So there's a lot more of that need to maybe shake it off after your work or after shooting. How do you sort of shake things off like when you've got these dark days on set, really? Um... I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Sometimes it's uh, it's hard to shake it off. I, and if you have to keep continuing going to set in that in that mind state, um, or you have to keep kind of jumping back into it. Uh, I don't know. I I know it's not real, so it's not mm -hmm. it's not actually who who I am. If I'm playing mm -hmm. something that's some sort of hideous character that uh, you know hurts people and enjoys it or something, mm -hmm. you know, like that. But uh, it's a strange thing. Sometimes, sometimes it'll take a couple of days after after a shoot's finished to sort of realize, wait, do you, you realize this awful, terrible thing you did? Kind of, kind of like sometimes when you do something awful um, or you feel terrible about it, you it doesn't kick in until it, it could. It's different for everybody, but for me, it doesn't kick in until a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of years later. <laughs> a couple <of> years. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I remember I, I did this film, The Birth of a Nation. I was playing on this awful, terrible slave driver who treats his slaves, these people, mm -hmm. as if they were um, livestock. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, this particular guy would beat his livestock, would, mm -hmm. would, uh, would um, you know, just tear them to pieces if he had to, mm -hmm. if it made his job easier. And yet he needs this livestock. It's, uh, it's important to him. And just being in that state of mind was crazy. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, realistic. Um, I grew up on a farm, so I kind of, I knew how to handle, you know, big livestock. While and I, I didn't treat it. Uh, they weren't pets. They weren't friends. They weren't, you know, in my, in uh, most of the uh, uh, um, examples. But um, I didn't. I was sick. I was sick to my stomach after a couple of scenes that we shot. But. Uh, and that was days, that was days after I'd already come back home from shooting. Um, it, it can be pretty sickening, but uh, I don't know. And it's that's, different every time. And that's what I was thinking of in particular with The Birth of a Nation. I mean, like even just clips of that film are so powerful that to have worked on an, for an extended period, for an extended scene, that to me it's hard to just shake that off. Like seeing a movie sometimes, it's hard to shake it off after just a couple hours in a theater, let alone living and breathing it to prep yeah. for it, to shoot it, to come home and have to decompress from it. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's intense. It's a lot of intensity. So how did Nate Parker keep this set, I guess, Guess, calm enough that it didn't turn into a sort of like uh, high, heightened tensions all the time yeah um, wow well one particular day I was shooting I um, it was so strange because I'd meet people and then ten minutes later or five minutes later we're shooting a scene where they're whips and you know mm -hmm. cracking and breaking flesh and you know, busting people's jaws open and just just having somebody in chains and just kind of all, all of the awful things you're doing um, in that business that was, you know, the slavery uh, um, economy and business. Um, the uh, the man would just bring us all together because he knew it was heavy. We were doing we were shooting it in the South. There were mm -hmm. we were standing on the on the graves of the slaves of the South. Um, you know, the blood was in the, in the, in the ground right there. It was, 
it was, uh, and, and he understood it so well that he knew what our reactions would be within the context. So he was able to sort of wrangle us, mm -hmm. make us feel safe, and then let us, let us know that this isn't personal, guys. This is just mm -hmm. us. We're all telling a story. We are a team here. Mm -hmm. So it's not personal, even though you just met Dominic and he's, right. you know, treating you so in, inhumanely. Right. Um, we're, we're a team here and we're telling this story. We're telling it with our hearts and our, you know, mm -hmm. it's, he was, he's a natural born leader and um, spiritual man. Like, so, and that's how he got that movie f made that's how he got the people involved the artists and the designers involved um the crew to work for scale to do that film mm -hmm. um it's because they saw how passionate he was that he wanted to tell a story that hadn't been told and so i felt that it was it was like it, I, I, I don't spend a lot of time personally in in like spiritual i don't i'm not, i don't spend a lot of time uh, church anymore so I don't spend time in a spiritual community mm -hmm. um, but that's what it felt like I felt like I was amongst a spiritually healthy mm -hmm. and courageous group and he was he was the guy that made all that happen and, and was uh, leading the way and I would presume that so much relies upon the director in a situation like that with scenes like that because otherwise I feel like there's just this irrational sense of not being able to separate the real from the pretend that you're doing you know I mean essentially you're playing pretend and so that it's hard sometimes to separate that from hey I just met Dominic he's a nice guy from oh my god I can't believe him and to have like a very divisive set. So I feel like that really must come from the top down, from the director saying, let's smooth this out and make sure mm -hmm. we don't have those feelings. Yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I don't want anybody to ever feel uncomfortable on, on set or acting, while acting with me. Um, and uh, that's the professional way to go, is right. to just make sure that everybody understands like, where you're coming from, mm -hmm. that we're in this together, telling this story. Um, e even when you don't agree with how the scene is working, you know, or how, you know, or what maybe your scene partner is giving you, you still have to have um, a general sense of this is where I'm going to go mm -hmm. with this. Is that okay with you? Uh, usually it's like, oh, yeah, I go. I'm, I'm all mm -hmm. game. But right. Sometimes they don't really know. Um, but I, I, because I've done, I guess, heavy films like that and mm -hmm. The Glass Castle, which is yeah. a very serious, you know, uh, but you know open-hearted film um yeah that that, that kind of thing is just uh you know you're a team mm -hmm. and um if it's going to get really intense with mm -hmm. intense subject matter uh it's important to communicate mm -hmm. uh, as a director and as a uh, with your fellow actors what it is that you're after mm -hmm. and so that you know they can at least they're smelling what you're cooking and then they can <laughs> they can add their ingredient yeah. as well you know yeah I guess that's why you are the professional and I interview people I don't act because to me that would be I'd have that irrational sense of not being able to necessarily separate the real from the person who I'm who I'm talking to I'd much rather be the professional interviewer talking to you and knowing this is the person I'm talking to and the rest is very clearly the pretend yeah is this real right now though this is the real <laughs> we were talking about it before I thought you said this is <laughs> this is like a game, so games aren't real, are they? <laughs> games are real if you win. <laughs> I'm super competitive at board games. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Although I talk a lot of big talk, and then I frequently lose. So <laughs> I'm one of those big talkers, but, yeah. you know, unless it's checkers, in which case, game on. <laughs> uh, you but David. you're pretty competitive yourself. I mean, you grew up playing sports. That's not a, a lot of sitting did. in the background <laughs> type a lot of people thing. did. Well, there wasn't much, much. I, I, I liken uh, rural Ohio um, culture to, like, rural Texas in that we do um, uh, football is, like, a big option. Mm -hmm. Or it used to be back when I was in school. Now it's, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's like opened up because they got this internet thing. Um, <laughs> I keep What's hearing about <laughs> But uh, yeah, like that was sort of whatever. That was, that was what I focused all my, most of my energy on growing up. 
So, uh, why, why did you ask that again? What were we talking about? <laughs> Sports and being competitive. Oh, and yeah, I yeah. think that you have to be competitive in the career that you're in as well because there are so many people who want to do it. And it must have been difficult for you also to say to your family, like, guys, I've decided that, you know, forget horses, forget football. I'm going to go study theater now. So how did your family react? Well, my, my two older brothers were in theater. So um, they had paved the way. <laughs> yeah. It was just easy. It was so easy. I just kind of... <laughs> I just jumped on the bandwagon. I really did. I'm not kidding. Um, well, that's because they paved the way. <laughs> if your two older brothers were in law right now, this conversation wouldn't be happening. Right uh, now. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I, I, um, I, yeah, my, I, I had these really great examples of actors and artists who worked really hard, singers, musicians, um, before me, who um, were like my idols growing up and uh by the time i was in i think junior high my oldest brother was already starring on broadway and different uh, uh films once i got into college i was with my other brother there and uh um and then he jumped right out of college into like these huge broadway shows as well so i i had a false sense of <laughs> of ease <laughs> of ease actually when it came to stepping out into the the, uh -huh. the marketplace <laughs> the industry because these guys they made it look so easy i'm like uh -huh. yeah i can do that too but when i would you know do like a kickball change i'd fall over or, or it looked like yeah i had two left feet um so uh and i i don't know that, that just that just made it a lot easier but it also gave me a sense of by while being around that sort of uh you know that you know, like the Great White Way, the, that echelon of talent, you know, their friends and and such, and going to those mm -hmm. shows since I was young, um, that gave me a sense of, wow, these people are really that good. Mm -hmm. And and I think there's a, there's value in that. In, like, say, play, you know, you're playing, say, baseball in the minor leagues, like, it's not, that's really hard. That's mm -hmm. an impressive thing to right. be in the minors and have a spot on a team, but it's a huge leap. Uh, to the uh, majors, mm -hmm. and um, and so when you get a sense of that when you're kind of competing, not the art is a competition; it shouldn't be. Right. Um, but uh, when you're sort of competing for work or jobs mm -hmm. or whatnot, like y if you if you were around people who are pushing the envelope, like we said, mm -hmm. raising the bar, it's uh, I think it's good. It's good tough love for mm -hmm. you to know that that's uh, that's what's going on. Well, because if you weren't able to compete so well, it's hard to keep getting back up. I mean, even your yeah. brothers, as easy as their success may have looked to you, presumably there were also a lot of auditions that didn't go anywhere. Or maybe not. Maybe they really just fell into success very quickly. No, you tell me. no, no, no. No, no. Um, this, this, this work, people ask me a lot, like, well, my, my son, somebody from back home or something, they'll say that my, my son's thinking about going to... Cincinnati Conservatory, mm -hmm. where you went, is that, you know, he's done this, and would, would you mind giving us a little, you know, a couple of pointers of uh, advice, like, don't want your son to go to acting school, I don't want him to do that, you know, because is, is he willing to know what it is, the life that, you know, an actor is, whether it's in New York, pursuing theater, TV film, or if it's out, mm -hmm. out in Los Angeles, doing the same thing, or Chicago, it's really difficult, it can make you crazy, mm -hmm. in fact, the pursuit and, uh, of jobs, you know, trying to procure work mm -hmm. can make you crazy. And these cities that where the industry uh, is based, mm -hmm. especially New York and LA, are really hard to live in mm -hmm. for, for a lot of people. And so, um, you know, you really have to customize your life uh, to to this pursuit. Mm -hmm. And it can drive you crazy. I, my old one of my older brothers, he's he's a teacher now. Mm -hmm. Because the pursuit of it, he was talented enough to be, you know, in Broadway shows and play leads and work yeah. all over the place in world class theaters. Um, but the pursuit of acting and can can really twist your your head up, and the re and the constant rejection can be really tough. Right. So, yeah, um, and even even um, success like extremely successful people they mm -hmm. have a really hard time with it, and uh, you just gotta. Mm -hmm have a really thick skin and know how to get back up because that's what it is right. just life is just 
getting back up <laughs> after being knocked down. Yeah, because it is hard. And I think that, I mean, it's interesting with the football. I sort of hadn't thought of it, since I'm not very sporty myself, I hadn't thought of sports analogies. But if you're trying to be, say, a professional football player, there is a very definitive end to that career. There is a point where you are too old and you are not going to make the NFL anymore, regardless of how much you may keep trying. But with acting, it's very different because you could keep going as long as you're willing to keep pushing and pursuing, right? I mean, there are roles for any age. There aren't as many, but there are roles. Yeah. So how do you keep like spirits bolstered in between? I mean, you've had amazing projects. You've got big ones coming out right now that, like you say, it didn't just start that way either. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, it, it, it is analogous. Like, it's just hard work pays off every single day I'm doing something uh, or several things or a hundred different things that should or could eventually pay off you know 10 years down the road um, and I I view the things that are happening for me right now which are a couple of nice projects that are releasing and and different things that are coming my way I, I view those things as um, you know compensation uh, mm -hmm. from all the years I put in, right. you know, taking on that rejection or, or studying mm -hmm. um, when I wasn't getting paid for it or, uh, you know, the th all of the theater work that I did or the, you know, the the education that I got mm -hmm. to, you know, in school and going to theater and, uh, you know, learning how to analyze scripts. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I feel like all of that work back then is paying off right now and so mm -hmm. I'm still doing work right now that should pay off later on as well right. um, but uh, yeah and it was just you know even, even if it was just doing a student film mm -hmm. uh, a decade ago it was like needed that to get yeah. to the next level right. and then you know once I was at that level I, I needed you know another kind of project in, in order to get mm -hmm. to the next level so I just uh, I just continue to do it so yeah. and, and you're right you can act until the day you die if you want, mm -hmm. and you can always get you can always be getting better, or finding yeah. a new way to sort of explore the human condition, which is you know constantly evolving in my life. You know, I'm changing yeah. all the time, every day. So it's um, uh, things that I thought I could, you know, have my thumb on. Uh, last week, I like I don't even I can't even find where my thumb was anymore. It's <laughs> thumbs somewhere Changes else. Changes that fast. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, the stuff that I, I used to th uh, figure uh, I had f uh, situated and figured out in uh, in my life and how how to explore those things or or kind of set up an experience in a in a scene or in um, you know in a context of a story. Mm -hmm. I, I would approach those things differently now. I mean, I did. I've done films, um, you know, like where I was a protagonist and. And I would look at it, you know, a couple years later and be like, what were you thinking? Why, why did, yeah. there was so much more there mm -hmm. that you could have dug into. And so, you know, if I continue to always have that experience when I look back at my work, I'm just, it's just proof positive. So mm -hmm. I can just keep continuing to just mm -hmm. explore and dig deep. Which I think also has to do with having a thick enough skin that you don't look back and go, oh my God, what was I doing? Because you could look at that very differently and not look what I've learned, but you could be very hard on yourself too. You know, yeah. It depends on your personal point of view for how you're going to take that. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I feel like all that stuff can be very anxiety inducing. But yeah. I feel like your first big recognition recognition came from in 2012 with I Am Not a Hipster. I mean, you made it into Sundance, which is such a compliment. I mean, really competitive, really fantastic. And you guys actually, the cast formed a band, is that right? To try and actually get the feel of the indie rock scene? Yeah, well, well Joel P. West wrote the music for um, I, Not a, I Am Not a Hipster, and he, he composed the, uh, the the soundtrack, but he also, um, the, or the, yeah, the score. But he, he and he and the director, Dustin Cretton, they put together this idea, like, we want this, Dom, we want this, mm -hmm. uh, I got this idea of this script I'm gonna, mm -hmm. we're putting together, and will uh it's gonna be about a singer songwriter in san diego and they were all san diego based at the time and they're like so we want you to be this frontman guy and joel's already writing some music in the sort of headspace of this mm -hmm. story this guy i'm writing a script about and so 
he'd call me and we'd talk about it. I'm like, what, what's the guy, what do you think the guy's going to do? Oh, he's got this ex and he's not over. Oh, he's grieving his mother. That's mm-hmm. why he's in San Diego. Oh, okay. And l- eventually he'd keep sending me pages of the script as, it, as he was developing it. And it, I kept seeing, like, m- things I had said to him on the phone in the script. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what is, what's that about? I just said that to you. That, that was that's not supposed to go in the script. That's my personal <laughs> life. Um, but no, they put together. Um, Joel wrote all these songs, mm-hmm. and we, we, he, Destin put these songs in the story. So he's perform. We're performing on stage live, mm-hmm. which was awesome. Um, and what we did was before we released the film, is we put the, uh, we went into the studio, and we recorded all of these mm-hmm. tunes, like ten or twelve tunes. And then some of them were in the the filming, mm-hmm. so I had to learn the songs before. Um, we filmed them because we were doing them live, and we mm-hmm. had audiences and everything. We filmed the whole thing, um, and then eventually I learned all the songs, and we uh, we recorded this really rad um, uh, album called. The band's name is Canines, mm-hmm. and Canines is the album, and. Um, the story, you know, within the, the film, they, they're talking about, mm-hmm. so your band, Canines, mm-hmm. loved it, you know. Yeah. I was doing a, a radio interview like this, yeah. and it's just it's so strange because we were actually recording it right at that moment. But that was kind of a dream for me as a singer, songwriter, mm-hmm. uh, musician, to have somebody write songs that are way better than any mm-hmm. songs I could write. <laughs> and then I get to play them. I get to be this guy that supposedly came from me. Um, but because the film at the Sundance, um, we were invited, and it was a strong film, we were invited to go uh, on, a, on a pretty thick uh, festival circuit mm-hmm. tour. And most of these festivals invited us and brought us out to play as an amenity to, uh-huh. the, to the film, to the festival. So we ended up being a, a, a band that toured, and it was <laughs> awesome. And it was fun, it was like, it's really fun music. Uh-huh. Um, so we went into the studio to to record it but we really just went into somebody's bedroom closet to do that <laughs> um but it, it's a it's a it's a really great um uh album it actually it's, it's really consistent it's minimal folk rock alternative rock um it was a blast i still play those songs to this day and you guys have actually really good reviews. I found some website with all the songs listed and people like chatting, like leaving comments about how great they were. I mean, it's cause they're really the band angry. can come back together <laughs> and get the band back. <laughs> I, well, I, th- I think the music came from a, from a, an authentic place mm-hmm. of grief and, um, and, and I, I think a lot of anger mm-hmm. for this particular, um, this character. Mm-hmm. that was Brooke Hyde in the film and so that album I don't know res- it resonates with people mm-hmm. just the, the way it was really well engineered um, and uh, mixed together and, and it's it's Joel B. West is a, a singer songwriter in his own right he's got mm-hmm. a great band right now called The Tree Ring and he's working on a, a, another um, album uh, project another band project mm-hmm. called Flood Coats and they're fantastic Mm-hmm. And I just th- and he's composing all of Destin's films as well as all kinds of other films. He moved up here now. Joel, Joel uh, West has, and I, I was just lucky to fall, mm-hmm. you know, in line with those guys way back yeah. in '05, and I just lucky to be able to continue to work with them a little bit. So. And how did you feel when you first got the call that the film was going to Sundance? I mean, to me, that's like the pinnacle of an actor's career that you've got a film in Sundance, and you've had two. Uh yeah, I didn't I didn't really know at the time. Uh, what the gravity of it was, mm-hmm. how it was going to kind of change my um, sphere, you mm-hmm. know, of what it, what it did was it, um, the, uh, the it, it just opened up a lot of mm-hmm. doors uh, of opportunity and, um, and obviously sharing the film with people and it being, mm-hmm. though it has kind of a satirical title, sharing the film with people, it's got a, mm-hmm. a, a nice um, soul, uh, as a musical drama, so um, that was uh, that was amazing. The people you know who had lost family members, like it resonated with them mm-hmm. so much. The performances resonated with them, um, and sharing it with the whole hipster family was just killer. <laughs> yeah. I like referring it to like the hipster family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did you feel like, especially it sounds so silly. I feel like Washington State is like the hipster spot now. Washington State. Yeah, right. Okay. Isn't that like the hipster spot? 
I feel like that's where Hipster Santa is. Like that's what? if you haven't heard of that. No. Oh, you've got to go Google it. It was like this past year there was Hipster Santa that like kids awesome. could sit on Santa's lap and he was like dressed like a hipster. That's so cool. <laughs> he was called Hipster Santa. So that's I've what never heard of that. Of. I love that idea. Yes. <laughs> so now I have. Is he no really idea. skinny? I have no idea now where I was going with that. I he's I'm just skinny. lost on Hipster Santa now. <laughs> I cannot remember. I need to see this. <laughs> Let's put up a picture of Hipster Santa pull right up now. Hipster Santa. I feel like I need to do that. <laughs> like, you just keep going. Hipster Santa. <laughs> so, but when the movie came out originally, hipster was, I feel like, then not even as big a term as it is now. Was it? It was in coming 2012, in. was it coming in? It was coming in. We almost missed it. It almost <laughs> came in where, where, it's, where it was like old news. Um, and it, 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 it wasn't a full satire of it. It uh -huh. did... It did um, it did explore the the indie art scene in mm -hmm. San Diego, which is which is really awesome down there. Um, people, I think, um, and and they there are microcosms of that in a mm -hmm. lot of towns and cities in in the states. Um, it's a huge like, you know, mm -hmm. self beer brewing culture in like, you know, Portland and uh -huh. and uh, Seattle, sure and. Um, Austin and mm -hmm. all, all these places, all these new places I don't even know about. I'm not hip. I don't know. <laughs> I like that self brewing beer. Is that the like pinnacle of hipster? Making, I didn't know that. And making salsa in your basement. That's another thing. Salsa? Is that what you just yeah, said? I making make, salsa? Yeah. Making your own that's salsa. A, that's a hipster. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I that's the thing. Know that. They do it in Brooklyn. Um, but if you make it in, in your Brooklyn, basement, you're yeah. a hipster? I don't know. That seems so funny you to wish me. You like, were why that cool. salsa? Yeah, I look like salsa. <laughs> I don't understand. I think I can't wrap my why brain not? around. Why not? You're right. Some people say why salsa, others say why not. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> and like, why not guacamole? Yeah, well. That, that's the new trend. I mean, yeah, sure. <laughs> you can make that in your attic. Salsa well, in the you basement, can't, guac in the attic. You can't make <laughs> wine now, can you? Can you? You can turn water into it. <laughs> You can stomp Where are we grapes. Going? Where are we going? Like, I love Lucy. I've always wanted to stomp grapes. No joke. <laughs> Maybe you could work that or into a film. Keanu in A Walk in the Clouds. I love that movie. It's like the worst thing in it, but I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. I love the movie. <laughs> I, I have, like, this, uh, this strange fascination with sweeping melodramatic, um, like, period pieces. Especially strange fascination that like you want to do one or strange fascination oh, God, like yeah. okay oh yes yeah yeah because the costume that's why I have this long hair <laughs> so that somebody ready. will let so, so, I'm just always ready you can't see it but it's super long <laughs> but like take like me I'm ready like the ponytail guy <laughs> I'm there <laughs> I'm ready for my cravat is that how you say it cravat right what do you call it? the little um thing like up at the neck C R A V E T Okay. I, I know uh, a, 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 what is it, a boat uh, tie, the, uh, no, I don't. No, <laughs> well, that's why there's wardrobe on those movies. You're all set. You've got the hair. <laughs> now, you were also recently in Fear the Walking Dead, the Walking Dead spinoff. So mm -hmm. transitioning, I guess, from some movie work into TV world that we've seen now. Now, coming into a show like that in the spinoff, but... The show has been so popular. Did you feel coming into a spinoff like, whoa, I'm stepping into this sort of established medium already? Uh, <laughs> yes and no. I kind of tried to keep all of the hype around it or the excitement around mm -hmm. um, like the fan, <laughs> the fandom following excitement. I try mm -hmm. to keep uh, away from that so that, you know, I don't, I don't. If I'm working on something, I don't want to worry about how that's you know going to affect my. Mm -hmm. the first things first, you got to do a good job when you're mm -hmm. on on the day on the okay. set. Um, I, I actually I I, I haven't uh, yet come to terms with how huge it is. Anyway, mm -hmm. I I know that there's it's just like it's just probably the Walking Dead sort of world mm -hmm. is the more almost as big as or bigger than you know. Uh, the um, Game of Thrones world, so it's kind of that following, you know, yeah. all the expositions all over the world. People just love undead zombie yeah. um, TV, and I, I don't know. I, I didn't really, I didn't really uh, get myself worried about that. I mm -hmm. just kind of thought, 
okay, I gotta be in Mexico. Mm -hmm. To you know, I have to catch a train to Mexico. It just I, Wait, I catch just, a train? I just, they sent you by train? Yeah, I mean it's easier because then you have to drive over <laughs> the border. I don't know. I guess I imagine like you hop on a plane and then you're there. Uh, no, because it's um, where we were shooting was was very uh, desolate and. <laughs> And uh, what's the word? It was just out in the middle of nowhere, and so you hop on a train. I don't know why, but that strikes me as so funny. To. I love that, like it's very hop hard to get. You need like big trucks and uh -huh. stuff to get to where we were shooting in these, in this like compound area and stuff between in this valley and between. Because it wouldn't mountains. be safe. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I felt, I felt relatively safe in in Mexico. Oh, but, I was um, making a. I meant like be safe, like within the context of the show, like Walking Dead safe, not yeah. not safe in Mexico, safe. I feel like I need to clarify that. Mexico, perfectly safe. <laughs> Walking well, dead, not know. so safe. <laughs> I didn't know. I had never been there. I was, I've only been to, uh, I'd been to Juarez a, uh, like two decades ago mm -hmm. um, as a kid. And now you're, you can't go there, apparently, or you shouldn't. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, um, no, I, I really enjoyed, mm -hmm. I, I just, getting up and getting to where I need to be, that's mm -hmm. all I can handle normally so <laughs> that I made that long trip several times um, <laughs> through for this season is uh, I'm amazed and so I grew up uh, I grew up during the trip how long by, was that trip? by being able to take these um, international <laughs> uh -huh. trips and, and not screwing that up uh -huh. getting there on time I'm, I'm really proud of myself and we are proud of you and the fandom is proud that you were there they're happy that you were there for sure and do you feel like I mean to me like you mentioned coming in working with Brie Larson and of course there were lots of other amazing actors also in the Glass Castle was intimidating but to me I think of stepping into something that's so established with that fandom seems very like more intimidating I guess to me that you're stepping into a place where people have been together already and that like you say like there are conventions and fans and people who are rabid like no pun intended for the yeah. show I think it's I think it's important to to realize that when you get a, an opportunity to share something mm -hmm. story or you're part of that storytelling yeah. whether you're just you know whether, whether you got you're an under five or you're, mm -hmm. you're you are the sort of crux of the scene mm -hmm. or you are you know human furniture um, which I, I do all of those things um, I think it's important that if you do get that opportunity mm -hmm. to share something that you take it you take it very seriously. Yeah. I mean, it may be a comedy, but you take the opportunity seriously and you have fun. Um, uh, on set uh, with that crew, mm -hmm. with those with those actors like Kim Dickens and Dayton Callie and Daniel Sharman and, um, and and all of the guys are sort of in my troop uh, of uh, of military guys on the show. It's uh, it was just fun. Mm -hmm. And um, also, we're a team telling a story. I, I said that earlier, but it was—it's like you know they work really hard and under tough conditions for months <laughs> and months, uh, like eight months. I think it takes to shoot a season nonstop, mm -hmm. twelve-hour days to fifteen, sixteen-hour mm -hmm. days. It gets—it gets crazy. Um, so that's that's the main thing. But mm -hmm. everybody, they kind of have a really good thing going as far as um, treating everybody with respect mm -hmm. and uh, they have a different director sometimes every episode mm -hmm. the same producers oft times I think the same um, they have the same director of photography and, and that will switch up here and there but like and, and the cameraman and the crew they're they're there their family mm -hmm. and the Mexican um, contingent of that which made up more than half I believe was was awesome mm -hmm. and there were a lot of different languages being spoken on set mm -hmm. but things got done quickly and efficiently um and safely even though it's such a violent and dangerous show with lots of stunts mm -hmm. um felt safe i yeah i, I felt I felt really good and, and though i wasn't a lead on the show i was um treated equally mm -hmm. amongst uh, all of those leads like uh, um so i I have had a really good time with it. And what do you think would surprise fans the most about set? About that experience that you had? Um, what surprised people most? What surprised you the most when you got down there? It looks like there's something. <laughs> I, I guess that they, what, would, what surprised me most was that 
the fans are always chomping at the bit at what is going to happen next. Mm -hmm. But the actors are doing the same thing, mm -hmm. up up to the, from the leads all the way down. Like we don't know what's happening mm -hmm. next, and that is great because it keeps you on your toes. One thing that um, um, Frank, uh, the guy that plays Nick, Frank Delane, I think is how you say his last name. He's a really cool cat. He's a musician himself. What he said is he's like, I don't I don't watch the show, I just shoot it. <laughs> So I'm like, you haven't seen the show. What are you talking about? I've seen it. You're great in it. <laughs> um, but he says, he says, well, the thing is, when you don't know what's happening, and you get the you get the scene, you get the scenes and the script like or the day before you're shooting it. Sometimes, um, you it makes you cut out all the fat, all the BS that you might sort of usually bring to a part, or you're overthinking or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's like, you just it makes you just take the the raw experience of it mm -hmm. that my my character's having you know and, and it makes me just you know cut out all the bs that i would have put in there you know and which would have made the performance mm -hmm. worse or whatever it's mm -hmm. like it just makes it more and that's the great thing about him mm -hmm. he, he reminds me of uh somebody said this so i'll just say it he, like, he's like the you know he reminds people of johnny depp and mm -hmm. it's johnny depp is very simple mm -hmm. before he started into his like wild um um sort of bold uh, character roles mm -hmm. like um, Blow and mm -hmm. What's Eating Gilbert Grape really close to the hip but it also like it's, it's resonant mm -hmm. um, and that's I think that, that's really cool interesting thing that you don't know mm -hmm. when you're in this story you don't know what's coming up so you just have to live in the moment as the characters and that's that's scary it's a lot of hard work and it's mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of pressure on you yeah yeah, it sounds in it like an intimidating way to work, but clearly it works for him. So yeah, <laughs> all the power to him. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dominic, this has been so interesting, and I know people will want to keep up with you and all these great projects that you're part of, and many more upcoming ones. So I know you'll be updating that social media. Where can they find you? Remind everyone once again. Um, my name is Dominic Bogart, so I'm on at Dominic Bogart hashtag Dominic Bogart. <laughs> You know, on the on the regs, on the reg regular sites, I guess. <laughs> Somebody else is doing it for me. No, I, I get on there. I'm I'm still learning, trying to get on there, but. Well, it takes time, so make sure people get on there and, and say hello, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for coming thank in. You. I'm Zoe Hewitt. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Real Zoe Hewitt. Thanks so much for joining us on AfterBuzz TV Spotlight. On, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you so much. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.